Glad that Jesus is the center, amen, of our joy. Is anybody's life better just because Jesus is the center? Amen. God is worthy of all the glory. God is, oh, y'all acting like y'all ain't, it ain't Women's Day. I, I'm not really sure. Y'all might be tired. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, I don't know about you, but my soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. Hallelujah. I do bring you greetings in the name of my Lord and my Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. I'm able to do that because I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it has transformed my life and I shall forever be grateful. I do thank God for all the clergy that is here, those that are on the pulpit. Bless your hearts. I beat you to it, bless your hearts. I beat you to it. And those of you that are in the audience, I do thank God for the 2014 chair lady, Sister Eleanor Richardson, amen. We thank God for Brenda Holmes, for the team leader coordinators, the officers and committee chairpersons, and the 2014 Women's Day cabinet, the group cabinet, and our worship leader, Shawnee Newton. Amen? I hope I got everybody. Amen. I'm also thankful for the cheer, our deacon, Frank K. Richardson III, and the leadership team of Zion Baptist Church, holding on and holding on to what God has called them to do, amen, in this transitional period. We thank God who is able, amen? amen. And I'm thankful that I found out that I have some cousins here right up in the house. So it's good to see cousin William and Phyllis Eggleston, amen? Thank you, amen, for your presence here. I'm thankful for my classmate from Eastern University, George Van Norton, so I feel like I'm home, amen? And finally, Reverend Nate Coleman from the Bethel Baptist Church, where I'm going when I leave here, told me to say, hey, y'all. So, so that's what I'm doing. Can I remind you that this is Women's Day, and I know that things are a little hectic. Everybody's thinking about what they've already done. They're a little stressed because some things ran over. But I know y'all not going to rush the word, right? Right? We're going to pray and let God minister to us. Amen? Amen? God, we glorify you. We exalt you. We praise you. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for these sisters and these brothers, Lord God, that are fellowshipping, working together. Thank you for the brothers that cook, that are cooking, that are recognizing that we are one body in Christ. Thank you for these sisters that stand on the shoulders of the sisters that came before, the 51 sisters that came before them. Help them to recognize and understand that it's not by might nor by power, but it's by thy spirit. And so now, God, we pray that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me so that we can hear from you this day and leave glor glorifying you, empowered and encouraged, Lord God, to recognize that the work doesn't stop until you call us home. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There are many things that I love about being created a woman. Can I just tell you all that? Yes. The thing I love the most is that I have been created in the Imago Dei. That is the image of God. The Bible describes me. In fact, the Bible describes all of us as fearfully and wonderfully made. But since it is Women's Day, amen? Can I talk to the sisters? Let the brothers listen in, amen? I, I'm not ignoring y'all, but, but what I love about God is that God cannot be contained in a box. So even though I'm focusing my attention on the sisters, God the Holy Spirit has a capacity to deal with each and every one of us in the room, regardless of our gender, age, and occupation, amen? And so God and God's sovereignty will move all up and through this place. Are we open and available? Are we waiting to see what it is that God wants to say to us? So, so what I love about being a woman, while I love that, there are some things that I struggle with. I struggle with the negative stereotypes associated with women. Have you, have you ever heard some negatives? I read a status on Facebook that I believe reflects such a stereotype. A person posted a status raising the question, why are certain words prescribed with negative connotation associated with women and girls and not with men and boys? When we hear that, it's never used for men, but it's used for women. And the word that I'm referring to is bossy. 
Have you ever heard bossy? And maybe some people have, but I've never ever myself personally heard bossy affiliated with men or boys. But I've often heard it with sisters. Just me? Okay. Why are you being so bossy? Stop being so bossy. You're not the boss of me. Can anybody relate to those words? Girls and women who run things are considered bossy, but men who rule things are called leaders. They're called assertive or take charge kind of guys. These are just things I'm just thinking about out loud. That's all, I'm just thinking out loud. I wonder when some people, both male and female, embrace the notion that women cannot get along with one another. Have you heard that one? I'm just saying, I don't know what's going on over here, but at Penn Memorial, sometimes people actually think that we don't get along. And, and if there's any truth to that, when did it become a common assumption that women just can't get along? Could it be that perhaps some men have gotten this belief, sisters, from us? How many times have you ever heard a woman say, I have more male than female friends because women are petty and catty and, and we just don't have time for that? How many times have you heard them say, I'd rather work for a man than a woman because, and then they have a whole litany of reasons why they feel that men are better bosses than females. And so I would argue that some of the reasons may be true for us, while it may be true for some women, it's not true for all, and yet the negative stereotype persists. These are just some things I'm wondering about as we focus on unity on Women's Day. Women have also been referred to as drama queens. If I'm honest, full disclosure, I have been referred to as a drama queen, always starting something or keeping something going all the time. And while this is not true for all women, it may be true for, say it with me, some women. It doesn't help us as women that these negative generalizations are always uh, starting something can come to us often through the media. Y'all watch reality TV lately? The Housewives of Atlanta, New York, Beverly Hills, Love and Hip Hop, even the Braxton girls get all up and through it. And those sisters, those shows dwell on sisters that spend their days trying to live life on life's terms, that's what they say. But the shoes shows usually are about women that are focusing on their day-to-day, -day, how they get along and how not to get along, and they have jam-packed social calendars. And the problem, though, is that they often spend some time cussing each other out, getting into fights. Oh, I'm the only one that watches those shows. <laughs> and, and some of them, are, they, they call it housewives, and many times a lot of them are not. And so I'm just trying to figure all of that out. And so in no way, it may seem to be that, that when we're talking about Unity Day, I'm talking about stuff that has nothing to do with unity cussing people out, talk about frenemies, y'all heard the word, right, right? And so it seems though, that many times, if we wanna talk about unity, maybe, maybe we ought to start with what unity does not look like. And maybe if we look at what unity does not look like, maybe, just maybe, we'll be more intentional and deliberate within the body of Christ. In thinking about what disunity looks like for both women, both inside and outside of the church, we cannot ignore the fact that sometimes, listen to me, brothers, sometimes, no shade, I'm not throwing, you know, whatever, but sometimes a man is at the root of the disunity of some of the sisters. Can I get a witness? Just some. That this may be difficult for some of us to hear. In fact, as a woman, this is difficult for me to say, but if you're going to keep it real, can we say that every once in a while there's an issue, even in the church, between a couple sisters, triple sisters, many sisters, and a brother? I'm not saying all the brothers, and I'm not saying that the opposite is not true, but it is Women's Day, amen? So, so I'm just focusing on the sisters, and it seems that sometimes... Almost nothing creates more confusion, drama, emotion, and interferes with the unity of sisterhood than when a man is involved. And in those cases, when the unity and drama takes place, if the man is in the wrong, sometimes, instead of the sisters checking the man, we 
gonna take off the earrings and roll all up in the sister's face as though she and the brother is not complicit. Can I get at least one witness in the house? Just one. So, so back in the day, there was a beef uh, musically between a sister by the name of Shirley Wilson and another one by the name of Bar Barbara Mason, and it was a musical dialogue and a discourse about a sister that was checking another sister, and so she calls her and she says, hello, may I speak to Barbara? Barbara, this is Shirley. You may not know who I am, but the reason why I'm calling you is I was going through my man's pockets this morning, <laughs> and I found your number. And so, woman to woman, I don't think it's being any more than fair to call you up and let you know where I'm coming from. Y'all still with me? She says, now, Barbara, I don't know how you're going to take this, whether you're going to come out of your bag. Remember that? <laughs> but, but, but I think that it's fair to let you know that the man you're in love with, he's mine. From the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, the bed he sleeps in and every piece of food he eats, you see, I made it possible. The clothes on his back, she says, ha, ha, I bought them. The car he drives, I pay the note every month. All of that is problematic for me. That's another sermon for another day. But she says, so I'm telling you these things to let you know how much I love this man. And woman to woman, I think you'll understand just how much I'll do to keep him. Any of y'all have a flashback? <laughs> woman to woman, if you've ever been in love, and she goes on to talk about that. And then she says, am I right or am I wrong? I'm not going to let you break up my who is not to be dissuaded comes back. It takes her two years to have a comeback, but she comes back a couple years later and she says to Shirley, basically, from this woman to you, I'm a younger woman. I don't mind sharing. You stay in your lane, I'll stay in my lane. I'm, you, he's your one, he, I'm, you're his wife, but I'm his woman and we're the two women and, and it's too many, too, too many women in his life. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that sounds like drama, amen? And let y'all get all twisted. I know some of y'all been saved a long time, but we ain't always been saved. And salvation has not even kept some of us from having this type of drama. Can I get a witness? I'm just talking about disunity. But, but both of these women see these men as property to be fought over and purchased for the services they provide to him. They both feel that they have exclusive rights to this one man and their dis disagreement is di disrupting the unity of the sisterhood while the brother reaps multiple benefits from being in a relationship with both women. The reality is that women in the 20th and 21st century are not the first ones to struggle with this type of situation. The sad reality is that for every sister that's trying to work toward unity in the sisterhood, there's also a hater trying to throw salt all up in the game and perpetuate negativity and hate. Sadly, the body of Christ is not immune to generating divisive, mean-spirited behavior. And if it was not the case, Paul would not have written the letter to the church of Ephesus in the first place talking about unity and love. There are multiple examples of disunity among women that can be found in the Bible. I'm only going to focus on one today. Would you turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 16, verses 115, as we focus on unity among sisters and brothers in the body of Christ. Genesis, chapter 16. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Herein, theologians believe Moses, who is the author, wrote this, and, and these are the words that are written. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar, so she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. 
It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur, and he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel said, I will increase your descendants so that they too will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him and he will live in hostility toward all of his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. For she says, I have now seen the one who sees me. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the man the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him, Ishmael. Asking you please to pray with me as we focus on the thought, stop the drama and show some love. Stop the drama and show some love. And so, so this book of Genesis, what a great place to start when we're talking about unity because it is a book of beginnings. The beginning of creation, the beginning of diverse languages, the beginning of a covenant, the beginning of God's chosen people, and also focusing on God's, God's creation and relationships. This book is talking about a sovereign God who even after the earth fell, was devising a way for us to be back in communion with him. And so we find that there's a historical legacy of God's chosen people even in this book. Abraham, and, and what it does is it lets the people know where you come from. How many of you know? I know this church, y'all know about legacy, amen? And so there's Abraham. In other words, we want you to know how we got to Egypt in the first place. And so there's Abraham, and then there was you know, Egypt, and then we became slaves, and then there was Joseph, and then we got out of there. And so now what we find is that Abraham is in the wilderness, and God has given him some promises round about chapter 12. In chapter 15, God has said, you will have a son. But in chapter 16, we find a sister by the name of Sarai who was a little bit impatient. Anybody impatient in Zion today? And so the problem is that Sarai has been childless for 10 years. The Bible never says whether Abraham told her that God had given her a promise, but the Bible does say that she goes up to him and says, Abraham, we have a problem. I can't have any kids, and so what I think I would like you to do is I have a plan. I want you to hook up with Hagar. I'm going to let her be your wife. Go into her, and maybe, listen to what she says, I can build up a family through her. To us, it might not sound like a big ding, but, but, but back in the day, culturally, what happened was if a woman could not have a child, they looked down on her. And I wonder how different that is today. How many of you are single over a certain age and are sick and tired of people asking you? Yeah, so y'all kind of feel a little bit of that, right? And so in that time, Sarah was beautiful, she was powerful, she had lots of money, but she had no children. And because she had no children, people looked down on her. But there was also, in the cult of Hammurabi, in the ancient Near East, the opportunity for women to have children through surrogacy. And what that meant was that another woman could have a child by sleeping with the husband, but when the child was born, the child was not, you know, not the responsibility of the person that bore them, but the other person. So in other words, Sarah is looking at Hagar as property. Carol Meyer says she looks at her as an incubator or a womb with legs. And so the bottom line is that they, they, they sleep with her, and so the bottom line is that they, she becomes pregnant, and the Bible says that Hagar looks at her mistress and despises her. So the problem was, I can't have children. The plan was, get with my husband. And now the problem is that now, Hagar, who has had no opportunity to negotiate her own body, now recognizes that I can do something that you can't do. And so the social hierarchy has been disrupted. How many of you know some people will fight to maintain their position at the top? That's another sermon for another day, too. I'm just putting that out there. And so for a while, there now there is a shift in the hierarchy, and so Hagar is walking around acting like she is all of that because she can do something that Sarai could not do. And, and Sarai had not counted arrogance, pride, and falling from position herself. And so she who has devised the plan, how many of us done some stuff, and then we go back to the person as a we had nothing to do with the mess that we find ourselves in. 
She goes to her husband and she says, may the Lord judge between you and me because this woman right now is all up in my face acting like A, B, C, and she's going on and on. And Abram does something that some brothers do in the house when they're just trying to keep the peace. It ain't none of my problem. Do what you got to do. I'm out of it. Now, now, Abraham has been complicit the whole time, amen? He could have said, no, woman. God told us something, but when she said, sleep with this young <laughs> sister, by the way, from Egyptian, he ain't had no beef, but now he's saying, I'm out of it. And the Bible says that she mistreats Hagar so badly that Hagar runs away. A pregnant woman runs away to the wilderness. That must have been some kind of treatment, amen? So she's out there, but the blessing is that while she's out there, the Bible says that God found Hagar sitting by a spring, and that messenger of the Lord says, Hagar, where have you come from, and where have you gone? So, so this is the first time that anybody has even acknowledged that the woman has a name. And so in the wilderness, this sister finds personhood, and she has a conversation. And if you read it, you realize that she doesn't answer all the questions. She talks about part of it. Sometimes you can be in such pain, you can't really deal with all the drama in your life. If you could just go through this much, you'll be all right. But, but so she says, I'm running from my mistress. And look what God says to her. Go back. That's some of our testimony, amen? Go back. Go back to church even when they ain't treat you right. Go back to that choir. They, they, they shouldn't have did that, but, but go back. And so the Bible says that she says, I will call you El Roy because you are now the God that sees me. And, and I've always had issues with that, but what I like about this story is that Hagar is the first person, the first woman ever to be met by a divine messenger. She is the first woman to get that promise from God and the only woman to get promise of descendants. In fact, she had the same promise as Abraham and she was the only person, male or female, to ever name God. Why am I saying that? Even in the midst of her pain and mistreatment, God was working things out on her behalf. Somebody ought to be encouraged. People don't see you for who you are. They don't like you. They don't respect you. But God sees past the drama. And so, so what happens is she goes back, and, and so there's one more P that I want to talk about. Talked about the plan, talked about the problem, talked about the prophecy, but there's also some perpetuity that messed up the unity. Because Sarah stepped out of her lane and got into it, what we find is that when Sarah had her son, Isaac, around about chapter 21, she had some feelings about child number one, kind of like us. You might have a baby now, but I'll always be the first baby mama. Again, another sermon for another day, but do you see the pattern here? And so what happens is not only do they have disunity then, but that disunity has perpetuated itself from the time that Hagar slept with Abram until 21st century when Isaac, who is a descendant of the Jews, and, and Ishmael, who is a descendant of the, uh, of the Arabs, are still fighting to this day. Are y'all getting that? What I'm saying is you might think that the unity or the disunity is all about you. But you don't know when you start spreading that gossip how far it's going to go and the ripple effect. It may go all the way from generation to generation. There are people that ain't speaking to people in families because of what somebody did 10 years ago. Amen? And so I'm hoping and I'm encouraging you to be mindful about what you say. Be mindful about what you do. Be mindful about this transitional time at Zion Baptist when people want to pull you in and start getting you to slam people to recognize that you could be impacting the unity, creating the unity in the community stop the drama and show some love so so Hagar Hagar is running away she has heard her name and position change repeatedly in this text she has been called a servant became a wife is relegated back to a servant by Sarai is called a servant by Abram and neither Sarai or Abraham ever call her by name Plans are being made for her life and her body and her mistress is treating her with contempt. And so we recognize and understand that Sarai was in a position of power. And even though we understood why she was upset, Sarai forgot that Hagar was still her sister. But instead of treating her with love and compassion, her personal agenda superseded the humanity of this person because I want what I want. I'm wondering how many sisters are vying to be chair lady next year and what they will do to get it. I'm 
visiting, I'm just putting that out there, you know. How many people strive to do anything, like Malcolm said, by any means necessary, walking over whoever they got to do with it. I know what the scripture says, we're going to have unity in the body, but I tell you what, if you let her appoint her and not me, oh, it's going to be something. <laughs> Hagar gets pregnant and despises Sarah. And so, can you imagine the exchange between these sisters? And Hagar was a sister, y'all know that. And can't nobody have attitude and reflect verbally and non-verbally like a sister? I'm not even going to go into that, but can you imagine some of the exchange? And so, as a result now, two sisters are completely at odds. And so, the contention and the reason for this contention lies in part at the feet of a man who could have at least tried to keep the peace, but he bails out leaving the sisters to handle their business, generating disunity in the community that would last a lifetime. So now two sisters are not appreciating the humanity, the sisterhood of who they are. And I wonder why that is that sometimes we let the brothers off the hook so easily. They, they talk about all the things, some brothers talk about all the things that sisters can't do in the church. They can't preach, they can't lead, they can't... But, but brothers that can't even find the book of Genesis will put in, in some churches. And sisters that are much more aware will sit back and allow them to, some of them, to allow us to fight instead of educating ourselves, or more importantly, educating the brothers and some misguided sisters who have perpetuated the myth that we can't do anything. I'm not hating, I'm just putting out there that historically there has been disunity, but it's not always the brothers. I wonder how many people have been talking about, about you, really. And I'm putting that out there because y'all invited me and we talk about unity and you can't talk about unity unless you talk about unity and if they talk, disunity and if they talked about her, did y'all get all up in on it or did y'all shut them down? Did you say that's my sister? I, I wonder why Abram didn't step in and intervene and say, look, Sarah, this wasn't even about me. As a matter of fact, God had a, a position, and all I, you had to do was just chill and wait. And, and I realized that Sarah set things in motion with her plan, and I'm not resolving her of her responsibility, but I wish that Abram would have manned up. And I, and I wonder what would have happened if Abram had manned up. And again, I'm not throwing salt or shade on the brothers, I'm just saying, what would the condition of Philadelphia be like if more sisters womaned up and more men manned up and show up at the polls on Tuesday? If more people had gone in front of Nutter and said to him, all this money you're taking away from the children is jeopardizing not only their present, but their future, and you don't even know it. And if you don't get yourself together, oh, there'll be no more time for you. Are y'all with me? I'm talking about disunity and disunity. And so in her book, Just a Sister Away, Reverend Dr. Renita Weems addresses Sarai's use and abuse of class. Because it's not just about one sister hating on another sister, it's about a social hierarchy. It's about using class and arrogance and hypocrisy as an excuse to treat our sisters in a disrespectful way because we think they don't measure up to us because they are not educated, because they are not in a sorority. And if they are, they're not in my sorority. Ski week. That because they are single parents, because they are recovering addicts, because of where they live, I'm saying that some of us in the church are as complicit as Abram is and are elitist Christians in the body of Christ, thinking that because I'm who I am, because I'm where, where I live, that even though God says I'm not a respecter of person, when I look at you, I don't see you the way I see me. And I don't know why God would use you anyway. Stop the drama and show some love. I wonder why Sarai didn't check Hagar herself. Why did she leave it to somebody else to do? Why didn't she just sit down with her and try to find a way, woman to woman, to address the issue? Why didn't they just sit down and talk when they realized things had gotten out of hand? Why don't we sit down and talk? when we realize in the church 
that things have gotten out of hand. Y'all do read the church covenant, don't y'all? Isn't there a part in Matthew 18 that if anybody has an ought with somebody, they ought to, to you know, leave their altars, that gift at the altar and secure it without delay? There's even a procedure. If, you try, if I try to come to you and you ain't having nothing to do with me, then I go to somebody else. And if that doesn't happen, then I bring you before the church. But usually what we do is we go to everybody else but them, and we wonder why there's no unity in the body. Stop the drama. We don't know that for sure. The Bible doesn't say why the sisters didn't talk. But what we do know that is instead of diminishing, the drama escalates. Ab Abram abdicates his opportunity as the head of the house to maintain the peace, leaving Sarai to do what she sees fit. So now not only do we have Sarai mistreating Hagar, but Hagar is mistreating Sarai, and Abram's on the sideline waiting to see what's going to happen next. But, but the Bible says that even when Hagar ran, God went looking for Hagar. It's not that God didn't know where Hagar was. It's saying that Hagar, even though they are using you like a ping pong ball, I know where you are and I see you. And for the first time in the text, for the first time in the text, somebody actually consults Hagar and we finally hear her voice. Hagar, where have you come from? And where are you going? And sometimes we don't hear other people's stories because we don't take the time to ask because after all, our story is much better than their story. And I wonder how many people would just come into this church if we would go out to church and ask them, what's your story? I know I see you homeless, but it may be that you're not as trifling as we think homeless people are. So, so tell me your story. I know you don't have a whole lot of clothes on and you at the corner here and I can't believe that you would want to make your life like this, but, but what's your story? I care. I want to listen. You know Jesus modeled that type of behavior, amen? Jesus talked to an unnamed woman. Jesus talked to a woman at the well. Jesus told the woman in adultery to stop. And we're talking about unity, but we're so sure that if people don't look like us, act like us, fellowship like us, and roll like us, then we ain't got no time for them. Stop the drama and show some love. I must be honest that when I read this text in chapter 8, 16, and chapter 21, I don't like how things roll. Hagar is mistreated because of who she is, and God tells her, go back, submit. That's enough right there. How many of us have been mistreated by our bosses, by our family members, by people in relationships, and God tells us, because God is a God of reconciliation. He didn't say we had to like it, but God tells us, and we have to do it. Or the times when we said, I'm not going to do it, and the hell that takes place in our lives because of that. And can you imagine, I don't know, if I was Hagar, I'd have had some words with God. Excuse me? <laughs> Say, what? Don't you know what she did to me? How many of us say that in the church? I ain't going back to that choir because they gave that solo and she can't even sing as good as me. I'm not going back on the deacon board because they know that we ain't supposed to wear white after Labor Day. I'm sick of them <laughs> with the etiquette. And so we let silly, trivial things disrupt the unity. God spoke to Hagar, and then God spoke of the future, and, but, and so they had a conversation. And how many of you know that when you have a sure enough conversation with God, when you take the time to really hear God and see God, even if that word from the Lord makes you want to holler, your life will never be the same. What I like about Hagar, she might not have liked it, but the Bible says she went back and she did what she had to do. And in the process, she names God. And so she is a legacy that Sarai does not have. God had a conversation with Hagar that he never had with Sarai. As a matter of fact, when God took the time to talk to Sarai, he was getting on her because she was laughing because she did not believe the promise. God saw Hagar and Hagar saw God. How many of you know that when we see God, I just asked her, but I want to ask it again. When we see God, stuff happens. When we see God, we see love because God is love. When we see God, we see righteousness because God is righteous and God is holy. When we really see God, we see compassion, truth, justice, and forgiveness, and so much more because God is all of that and more. And when we see God and we see all of those things because we are made in the image of God, when people see us, they ought to see the same thing. They ought to see compassion. They ought to see
see forgiveness. They ought to see righteousness. They ought to see reconciliation no matter what anybody says. When we see God, we can see hope even in the midst of our pain. And so Sarai runs Hagar off, which leads me to wonder something else out loud. I wonder how many sisters we have run off from the church, from Penn Memorial, from, from this church, because they can do things that we can't do, because they have things that we don't have but we wish we did. Because they have relationships that we don't have, but we wish we did. Because they look better than us. Because they are younger than us. Because they have better jobs than we do. Because they can sing better than we can sing. Because they can organize. Because, because, just because. The child was called Ishmael, meaning God hears. And God doesn't just see, God also hears. And I wonder what would happen if we stopped shining the spotlight on ourselves. What would our churches be like if we stopped the drama and showed some love? If we saw God and saw others through the lens of a loving God who says, I know you caught up and I know you didn't treat me right, but you know what? Love covers a multitude of sin. Let's sit down at the table and try it one more time. I, I know you did it two times, but, but let's try. I know you did it three times, and, and I know that's biblical because the Bible says that Peter said, Lord, how many times? Seven times seven? And Jesus said, oh no, 70 times. And so what that means is some of y'all stopped too soon. How do you and I treat our sisters? How are we handling our power? We need to remember that when we mistreat our sisters and our brothers, we are mistreating God's creation, thus piercing the heart of God. Because people matter to God, they must matter to us. And it really is time to stop the drama and show some love. The difficult, it's a difficult text, and I don't know why everything went down, but the bottom line is, it doesn't matter. God is sovereign. It's not about me. I don't know why y'all going through what you're going through after y'all been here all these years. I don't know why you're struggling with finances and you're paying your tithes. I don't know why you're sick and somebody else is not. At the end of the day, God is still sovereign, and maybe, just maybe, God is doing an Abraham, Isaac, take him and sacrifice him thing in your life in my life to see will we respond it's easy to respond hallelujah when things are going well but when things when things aren't going so well zion the spotlight is on you and people are going to be looking to see how are you going to handle this current situation will you rally together and show some love will you make sure that when anybody starts talking about you you can say hold on wait a minute let me check you at the door. You must not know about me. Remember back in the day when we used to walk to school and somebody would talk about our mom, our dad, anybody in our family, but especially mom? We didn't even let your mom get out. <laughs> the earrings came off, the Vaseline came out, because if you talk about them, you talk about me. And so we need to rally together and recognize that united we stand, divided we fall, and if our back should ever be against the wall, we'll be together, together, you and I. So yeah, yeah, this story is about a story of courage and endurance and betrayal and abuse, but it's also a story about survival. Once I was afraid, I was petrified. <laughs> Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. Are y'all with me? We will survive. So, so what lessons are we to take from this story? How do we support one another even when we disagree without destroying and disrupting the unity of the sisterhood as well as the brotherhood within the body of Christ? First, we got to want to. Some people don't want to get along. So, so pray for them and leave them over there. And no, we want to. We have to ask ourselves, secondly, are we the ones creating the drama? And the Academy Award goes for the most disruptive person, too. Would it be you? We need to consider how our actions impact our sisters and our brothers, because it's not about us. 
We need to put into practice the vice of Paul who tells us in the scripture, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for, making allowance for, making allowance for each other's faults. How many of you got a fault? And you're making allowance because, what does he say? Because of the love. Make every effort. Did you hear the word effort? Effort. It ain't easy. Make every effort to keep yourselves what? United in the spirit. I didn't say united as Zion members. United in the spirit. Building yourselves together or bonding yourself together with peace. We need to understand that to endeavor to keep the unity in the spirit requires effort, work, love, respect, and most of all, submission to the Holy Spirit, who's the only one powerful enough to get black people to get along in the first place anyway. We need to show some love. We need to realize that we can do this unity thing. We need to know that we can stop the drama. We can show some love if we depend on the power of the Holy Spirit who empowers us and regulates our behavior if we would be open and submissive to the movement of the Holy Spirit. For it is not by might nor by power. How many of you tried and said, I just can't do it? But it's by thy spirit, saith the Lord. If we are to be all that God has called us to be as women and men of God, we must be willing to live in unity and community with one another. We must believe that we can be a church of unity and love. We need to stop the madness. We need to keep first things first and acknowledge that God's agenda always supersedes our own agenda. We, we need to recognize that it is not, not now, nor has it ever been, all about us. We may have it going on, but for real, for real, we're not all that. Can I get at least one witness? We need to recognize that anything that does not build up the kingdom tears the kingdom down. Satan is doing enough. He don't need no helpers, especially in the body of Christ. And if we see anything that adversely affects the reputation of our church, this church, or anybody in the church, we're not having it. We need to stop the drama. We need to check the haters at the door with that spiritual discernment when people roll up on us and say, child, guess what? If they even look like they're trying to stop some drama, let them know, ain't nobody got time for that. But most of all, we need to keep God at the center like the song said and love God, love the people of God and the things of God with the same intensity that God through Jesus loves us. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love suffereth long and is kind. Y'all know it. Love is patient. Love is kind. We know all that. We say it all the time. But Paul goes on to say something else in that same scripture. He says, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I spake like a child. I understood like a child. I acted like a child. But when I became a war man, I put away childish things. What is Paul telling us? Paul is saying we need to grow up. We need to stop playing church and let the church be the church that God has called the church to be. We need to stop the drama and show some love. We need to love one another. It's one thing to sing, the Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. So easy, so easy to love. It's easy to sing, isn't it hard to do? But God requires us to love one another anyway. It's not an option. The Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. It's not easy, but we need to do it anyway. Amen? Amen? We need to do it because sometimes if we're for real, for real, we don't even love ourselves. Sometimes we get on our own nerves. Amen? And if we get on our own nerves, do we, maybe we're getting on somebody else to stop the drama and show some love. And, and so one of the many things I love about being a Christian is that if my heart is right, even when I do wrong, because some of you may think that I'm unlovable because of what you heard, because of where I've been, because of what I've done. Are you with me? Aren't we judgmental? They come up to know Jesus Christ and they're like, mm, I don't know how long that's going to last. They're just only one day away from the pole. Y'all know. Y'all know. We say some stuff. They just put the pipe down yesterday, and instead of thanking God that they came forward, we, we throw in some salt and hate. And so basically what I'm saying is that it doesn't matter that you may think I'm unlovable. I know that Jesus loves me. Can, can I go to Sunday school for a minute? Jesus loves me. This I know. 
for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, though it makes me very sad. And let's go to the chorus. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. And because Jesus loves me, oh, I love Jesus. He is my savior when life is raging. He is my shelter. And where he leads me, I will follow. I love Jesus and he loves me. And when you love somebody, you want to tell them, I love him. Yes, I do. 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 Oh, I love him. Yes, I do. I love him. I love Jesus and he loves me. Amen. I know that he loves me. How do you know, Crystal? How do you know he loves you? Because when I was messed up, the Bible says that even before he knew me, he died on the cross. He went to the cross. They disrespected him. They, he was on the cross and he could have come down, but if he had come down, I'd have been lost. And because he didn't want me to be lost, he hung on the cross. Because he didn't want you to be lost, he hung up on the cross. Because he didn't want your children, whether they're locked up right now or hanging out on the street, one day if we pray enough, if we trust God enough, if we stop the drama long enough, they're going to come in and they're going to recognize that Jesus loves us more than they love themselves. So let us endeavor to keep the spirit and unity in the bond of peace. Let us stop the drama. Let us sow some unity. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. I need you. We are a part of God's body. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. We are a part of God. It is his will that every need should be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. So my song, is I, my, the last song that's on my heart as I take my seat is, Lord, I want to live for you. I want to do the right thing. So, so, Lord, I can only do unity thing if I have a clean heart. So give me a clean heart so I might serve thee, Lord. Fix my heart so that I may be used by you, for I'm not worthy of all these blessings. Give me a clean heart, and I will follow thee, and I will stop the drama, and I will show some love.